and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the news and top-selling games from February 1989. I check out the TZX Duino. I play some games, have a chat to Jeff, and end with a special Spectrum. But first, the news. Weird Dreams is a game that's available on the 16-bit machines and also features on the Saturday morning television show Motormouth. It's a very obscure and, well, weird game. But good news for Spectrum fans, it's been converted over to the Sinclair machines by Rainbird. Spoiler alert, the game was never released though. Sir Clive is still around and his company, Animatic, are about to launch a new chip, the WSI, or Wafer Scale Integration. The design is said to combine both processor and memory to improve performance. Clive is also busy with other matters and is also getting married to Bernadette Tynan this year. Ultimate Play the Game, the mega successful software company, will be back in the land of 8-bit very soon. In 1988, they sold most of their back catalogue and name to US Gold, before moving away from computers to concentrate on the console market. Now, Ashby Computer and Graphics Limited, or ACG, the real name behind Ultimate, have said they plan to return to the computer market, producing titles for both 16 and 8-bit machines. ACGs also say they have bought back the rights to their old games and possibly plan to use some of their characters again, including Jackman and Saberman. The Spectrum is still strong in the marketplace, with several high street retailers claiming they were close to selling out of the machine around the festive period. Both Comet and Dixons had very high turnovers for the Sinclair machines, shaming WH Smith who decided to no longer supply them. Games were also good sellers, with licensed games and budget releases selling well. It seems that there's still life in the Sinclair machine yet. US Gold have got the license to produce a game based on the recent Michael Jackson film Moonwalker. The megastar sets out to save the world from Mr. Big in the film, turning into a variety of different things on the journey, including a giant robot and a car. Jackson's dance moves are of course featured as well. It's not known if any of these things will appear in the game, but with a name like Michael Jackson, it's sure to sell well. And that was the news, and now onto the top selling games. At number 5 is Thunderblade from US Gold. At number 4, Double Dragon from Melbourne House. At number 3, Operation Wolf from Ocean Software. At number 2, Afterburner from Activision. And at number 1, Robocop from Ocean. And that was the news and top selling games from February 1989. Tired of rewinding tapes? Too many games on your shelf? Tape loading errors bugging you? Still want to load the games in the authentic way? Then this device is everything you need. This is the TZX Duino. These devices come in several forms. Some just have bare circuit boards, others have full injection moulded cases, and some, like mine, come with a nice 3D printed case. The prices of each version reflect this. So, what is it? Imagine a digital audio player, something like an MP3 player, or even a smartphone. Yes, we'll get onto those later. Well, the TZX Duino is a digital tape player. It replaces those old analogue devices with this neat little box. My version is 7cm by 6cm and 1.5cm deep. It has an SD card slot and 5 buttons marked play, stop, forward, reverse and select. There are two audio outputs and a mini USB for power. And on top a really nice clear LCD screen. It's designed to be used as a real tape player in that it will load software in real time. It doesn't have flash loading games like the DivIDE devices, so this will load things in the good old authentic manner. In operation it's very simple. You copy some TAP or TZX files onto the SD card, pop it into the device, connect it as you would a normal tape player, plug in the USB to get some power, 
And off you go, everything is just as it was with the old analog devices. Games can be stored in folders, and using the buttons you can navigate through to find the game you want. The only difference here of course is there's no volume control to mess about with, no tone to tweak, no tape heads to adjust, it just loads. Well, it usually loads. Some games have problems, and that could be down to the TZX files, or some special loader that's used. For example, Ant Attack had problems for me, the TZX just didn't work. So I tried another version, and that seemed to go okay. Sadly you can't save data back to it, like some other storage devices. So how does this differ then from the smartphone apps that you can get and load up with MP3s? Well, to be honest, not very much. Other than it's smaller, can always be plugged into the Spectrum and sat next to your machine ready to go, you can hold your entire collection on the SD card, and I would say it's a lot easier to use. I like this device. It's small and works really well, especially if you want to load games the way they were meant to be loaded. As an added bonus, it also makes using real peripherals easier. Many of the things that I've tried either don't allow the smart card or divide ye to be plugged in because of physical reasons, and some just don't like them at all. This though is the way around it because you can load the files without using the analog tapes. It also means that you won't wear out your tapes or run the risk of damaging them in the real player, which has sometimes happened to me. Overall then, a neat device that will load your games in the authentic way and can easily replace those old analog players. This is Pub Games, released by Alligator Software in 1986. This game was written by Rich Stevenson, a guy who I had the pleasure of meeting at the recent Revival 2018 event. It consists of six games that used to be common in pubs, but now you'd be lucky to find any of them, well, maybe with the exception of darts. And darts is the first game. There are many dart games for the Spectrum, and sadly this isn't one of the better ones. You control a crosshair that moves around randomly, circling another randomly moving point. This is tricky to get used to, so games can be quite long. The whole series of games can be played in two ways either individually, as a practice game, or all games back to back. To play the latter, you have to play through every section of every game, something I did for this review, to show you how it keeps the names and scores of both players, because this is a two-player game. The dart players are drawn the same, and have limited animation, just moving their arm when you throw the dart. The sound is almost non-existent, which is a shame really. There's some odd beeps here and there, but very little else. When you complete the darts, it's on to the next game, Bar Billiards. And again, there are similar games around that prove to be better. This game has no instructions with it though, which makes playing very difficult. Moving the angle of the queue is done in fixed steps, which makes the game almost impossible to play. Also, not knowing the rules made the game into just a random knocking the ball around a table and see what happens type of affair. All again with very little sound. Next we move on to dominoes, a fair game, but I think the rules have been tweaked because you can't place dominoes across the other to form a T-shape. Apart from that though, the usual rules apply, and there are control instructions on the screen, which does help. Reaction to a key press during this section is sometimes delayed, so you have to be patient. Once you've completed that, it's onto table football. Here you control the teams, but you only control the players in the area that the ball is in. This means you can only control one at a time, which again is tricky. You can move the players up and down and also change their angle. You can set them as up, down or forward, and using a combination of all of these allows you to kick the ball. This mechanic is very awkward and difficult to get used to, and the ball can sometimes bounce around the table for ages, 
and the ball movement is continuous as well, so there's no slamming in a long shot from defence. Another problem is the ball moves straight through players, even if they're in the down position, which doesn't really make sense. Eventually someone will win and you can move on to the next one, which is Pontoon. Yes, we all know how to play this game. You bet at the start of each round and the game plays through as each player tries to get as near as to 21 as possible. Next comes another card game, Poker. Again it plays as you would expect, with runs, doubles and triples etc. Nothing special. Here you can win or lose some of your money, and eventually you'll get on to another game, the last one, which is Skittles. This plays pretty much like most other bowling games. A target moves along the back of the skittles, and you control the ball at the front, and when you think they'll line up to give you a good result, you hit the key. The whole game is played with just one key. The ball moves down the alley, hits the skittles, and you get a score. And again all this is in silence. The only sound you do get, which was a complete surprise, is when you get a strike, and then this happens. Finally, at the end of the game, if you have played all the way through properly, you get the final scores, and a nice image. Overall I have mixed views on this game. I suppose it could be fun if you had a friend to play with, and you'd both been down the pub and come back and wanted something to mess about with in 1986, when there was very little in the way of home entertainment. Looking at it now though, I think it's showing its age. This is Laser Warp, released by Microgen in 1983. This is an early game, and it certainly shows it. Yes, it's a vertical shooter, with a lot of things happening on screen at once. There are the constant firing blue projectiles that can really get in your way if you're not careful. As well as these, there are the aliens to shoot. These vary in both look and movement for each level, and of course these are always dropping bombs. And if that wasn't enough, there are indestructible objects flying about too, so you have to be alert. And all of this makes the game tricky. To progress you have to destroy all of the aliens, the ones that can be shot at least anyway. As each level arrives you are told what to expect next, and then it's into the action. The graphics are average, with little or no animation, but they move smoothly enough, especially considering the amount of things that's on screen. Sound is the typical microgen sound you'd expect from the early games, and works well with this game. The control is good and responsive, but I'm not sure this will suit everyone. I quite enjoyed having a quick blast of this to see how far I could get, but it's not a game I would play for long periods of time. Connected to this is a game called The Game, and so the story goes in 1985 this was sent to local newspapers for readers to collect. It formed a part of a competition to see who could get the highest score. The winner would then get another game, Battle of the Planets free. Was this just laser warp reused? Well, both games seem almost identical. The only difference being, when you lose all your lives in the game, you get a text message and a code to confirm your high score. Other than that though, I can't see any difference at all between the two games. An interesting bit of info to round things off then. This is Tea Leaf Ted, released in 2018 by the people on screen. 
This is one of those games that really reminds me of those early releases on the Spectrum. Gameplay is simple. Collect all the coins on screen to reveal a key. And this will then let you progress to the next level. Randomly moving enemies have to be avoided. And because they're random, you sometimes have to be very patient. And wait just for the right moment to rush up a ladder and collect a coin. Some enemies, like the Gold Digger in later levels, will take coins from you. And there's also a dog that bites you, so be careful. Also, because they are random, it does mean that you can get trapped unfairly, just like the old school games of the 80s. The graphics are large and well drawn, as you can see, with some nice animation. Sound is good and used well, and there's a nice tune that plays all the way through, with some nice spot effects. Control is good, and if you like the old style of gameplay, then this is worth a go. It can be frustrating though, due to the randomness, but certainly worth a play. Oh, come on then, let's do books. What books do you have? What books do I have? Um, I've got... Start with your favourite, I think. It's the Video Gaming Pioneers by Andrew Hewson. Yes. You I... recommended that to me, uh, I if did. I recall. I don't think I'd call that my favourite. It's very, very good. The only thing I didn't like about it was there was absolutely no pictures or photographs or anything in there. It was all text. I mean, it does actually mention it in the... I don't know if it's at the end or at the start that says... You will notice that there's no no pictures in here, which I think is a bit of a bit of an omission, really. It is, yeah. I know what you mean. I don't think I call that my favourite. It's very very good. Yeah. Now I, I really liked Andrew Houston's. Don't get me wrong when I'm saying that. I I still really mm. love those ones. Um, well, it's interesting. One of the things I was going to ask you is, do you like books that have reviews or kind of information, company profiles, and things like that? Because I think I prefer the ones where they just talk about the games and review the games. Which I'm, is... I'm different. I'm the opposite then, because I, I like the background information about the companies and the how games came about and all the problems they had along the way. Yeah. You know what? I think I I got sick of all the company profiles from how many there were in Retro Gamer over the years. I used to love them. I used to read every single word in Retro Gamer, and over the years I've read less and less, especially of the company profiles, because they all just end up blurring into one and becoming the same. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the US Gold and the Ocean books, again, they're, they're very similar to that, aren't they? They, yeah. they do a lot of things, and there's a lot of similar things in those that's already been published. The quality of the paper and the images on them are really, really good. Yeah. On a similar vein, going, going through a different book, Remember last year at Revival, I won a Gremlin in the Works book. Those are absolutely superb. I've got them here. I thought I would just be getting a paperback book. I didn't re realise how much effort just went into the production of these. 90% of the book is interviews with people. And I think that makes it better. I really like that. Like when you have the interviews, you've got the kind of exact accounts rather than somebody else's interpretation of someone's account, if that makes sense. Of all of the ones that give game history and things like that, I think the, the Gremlin in the Works is probably my favourite. I have three other books. Um, Deus Ex Machina, The Best Game You Never Played in Your Life by Mel yeah. Croucher. That is a brilliant book. That is everything that I want in a, in a book about software and, and yeah. companies. It, it talks right from the very beginning. It's, it's an excellent book. Yeah. And then the next one is Sinclair Zedek Spectrum, a visual compendium. Uh, I have again, that. A really good quality book. Yeah. Really thick pages. And then going on to the book that I dislike the most, and I am not don't want to diss anybody for it, is the, 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 the Spectrum Games Bible, 1982 to 1984. Oh, I love them. Yeah. And that's, just, that's probably the best one. 85 oh, yeah, to 86 that. is really good as well. Um, the thing that put me off is I got about a quarter of the way through it and I'd found about 20 or 30 mistakes. Now, you did say to me that the reviews were written by other people. Yeah. Um, not not one person. So you can ex I suppose you can expect um, mistakes in that sense. But if, if you're a casual user, you probably wouldn't pick up on all, a lot of things. But because it's dealing with the 
time of the spectrum where I remember best. And as soon as I read something, I, I can usually pick up that it's incorrect. And there's, there's one review of a game which has got three errors in it, and there's only there's only four paragraphs about the game. Actually, talking of those ones, so those uh, Spectrum Bibles, the last one, which is all of the kind of 2000 onward uh, homebrew games that have been released, mm. that one's really, really good because there are loads of games you find, find in there that are kind of hidden gems. Mm. Those Bibles... I really, really like. One that you haven't mentioned that I would uh, call out is Spectrum Nation. And there's Volume 1 and Volume 2. They're by Dan Whitehead. Oh, um, I've, Actually, I think I've got that on Kindle. I've got one of them anyway on the Kindle. Yeah. I forgot all about my Kindle. Have, have you read Volume 2? Volume 2 is the kind of games from other media. So he talks, he talks about games inspired by films. So there's film licenses, there's TV licenses... And it is absolutely brilliant because you get a little bit about the the film or the TV show and then you get the review of the game and like whether they compared, whether there was any similarities or not and that kind of thing. And it is really, really good. Another Kindle only one that's really good is the little book of Spectrum Games and another little book of Spectrum Games by, I think it's Ian Marks. Right, I think you can get hardback versions of that because I was looking on, uh, was it Retrofusion Books? Is it, is it like a small, I don't know, four-inch square little black book? Well, no, oh, because my, mine, mine, <laughs> mine are Kindle. <laughs> However, I think you may be right. Yeah. Actually, talking of annuals, we never mentioned the Crash Annual. Does that yes, count? Yes, of course. I've got that, yeah. yeah. Well, so I've got, I've actually got, have you not got the ZX Spectrum in Pixels? I've got a few of them. I need to um, get some more because you keep telling me how good they are. They're brilliant. I've got all three of them. On the visual compendium, you just tended to get a screenshot, didn't you? Whereas on, on the Spectrum in Pixels, you get the screenshot, the cover art, and the loading screen. Okay. Which which makes it, I mean, really, really good. So my, my book collection is going to swell in the next couple of months, I think. It may well do. Don't blame me. Um, <laughs> I, I am blaming you. I've got, a, I've got a few other things. I've got an 80s childhood from He-Man to Shell Suits. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think we should really stop there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's stop there. <laughs> This is Hard Cheese, released by DKtronics in 1983. The game is a kind of dig-dug affair, where you drive around the screen in your tractor, collecting what look like coke tins, and trying to kill the monsters. There are no instructions with the game, so I just had to try various things to see what happened. There are also rocks that I think you can drop on monsters, but I never managed it. You can fire a square block that moves around the tunnels you've created and kills anything that it hits. However, if it returns and hits you, you lose a life, so you've got to be careful. You can move to the next screen either by killing all the monsters or eating the cheese when it appears, which should kill all the monsters anyway. The action is fast and frantic, and the graphics move in character squares, but that's perfectly fine for this style of game. Sound is well used and reminds me a little bit of Maziacs, and there are a few beeper tunes in there as well that play when you start, lose the game, or get to the next level. Overall, it's not a bad game, quite fun to play, and if you like Dig Dug style games, then certainly give this one a try. I've had my eye on the ZX Renew website for quite a while, as my current Spectrums, when they're not being blown up by me, were getting a bit tatty. ZX Renew sell cases, faceplates, mats and membranes to completely change your favourite micro and make it brand new again. When they recently announced the LED membrane, I just had to get one. 
When I was at Revival 2018, I met up with Peter, and the result were a few items in my car loaned to me so I could see which one I wanted. I opted for a white case, a white mat, a silver faceplate, and of course, the LED membrane. The membrane is not the usual type, and actually has tiny switches. It came with these attached, but the instructions do say you have to solder them on yourself, so it's worth checking before you buy. There's also a power regulator that needs soldering with two wires to the motherboard to provide the required power to drive the LEDs. Once you get the old case off, you pop the motherboard into the new case and start the process of soldering. And I'll be honest, I was concentrating that hard on making the soldering right that I forgot to record much video. Anyway, eventually I had the motherboard installed and the membrane soldered in and everything inside the case. But before I put it together, I had to test that things worked. Yes, it does, and it looks really nice. There are three settings for the LEDs, off, high and low, so you don't have to have them on all the time. The switch can be added to the case if you're prepared to cut a hole in it, but I left mine just hanging out of the back. Happy that it worked, the faceplate was added, some new rubber feet were put on, and it was ready to start playing games. And later on at night, when it got dark, it looked excellent. The keys also feel really nice. They have an audible click if you listen carefully. So there it is, my pimped Spectrum. I must admit, I felt a bit sad leaving my old Specky empty, so I put another motherboard in and then promptly blew it up with a dodgy interface. Oh well. Even though I pointed this out at the start, I'd like to emphasise that this is not a promotion. I've not been paid to say this, or anything like that. These are products that I've bought myself, and I'm just telling you about. <laughs>